Hi hey there, my name is Pete Hammond. I'm going to moderate tonight. Um, I've got good news and I've got bad news. I know. Hey, first, the really good news. Did you all like Rome? Yeah. Great, great movie. Um, one of our guests tonight was supposed to be here, Brie Larson, but um, she is under the weather. Actually, could not get out of bed. So, sadly, I, I think uh, she's been probably working very hard to promote this film. So, she sends her regrets tonight, but I have the extraordinary director of this movie. I think you're going to be hearing about him for a long time here, all through award season with this movie, which just opened this weekend. It's doing great. Uh, please welcome Lenny Abrahamson. that run down the stairs they always do on chat shows. <laughs> I thought it, that's probably not a good idea. Would that be fun? That's like the ultimate fantasy. And I could play Phil Donahue. Um, all right, old joke. Uh, anyway, congratulations, Lenny. This is a tremendous movie. It's getting such great reviews and, um, and doing great business. People are coming out to see it. As you can see, not an empty seat uh, here at the Arclight tonight. So uh, that must make you feel good. Yeah, it's it's amazing because uh, we only finished it properly finished the film about six or eight weeks ago, and uh, you know the, all the post production, all the sound work, everything, and we took it to Telluride in Toronto. They were the first um, festival screenings, which were amazing because that was the first time we we got to watch it with an audience and feel the effect that it has, and then to be here and when people are actually coming out of their homes and choosing to come and see this film and filling a theater like this is incredibly gratifying. I mean, you know, you do, a, after so living with something like this for so long, yeah. it becomes somewhat abstract and then it becomes real again when you put it in front of an audience. How long has it been? When did you first come upon this project? Because obviously it's a best-selling book uh, by Emma Donahue from uh, 2010. How did, how did it come to you? It, I read it uh, early 2011. It was somebody in the office said, this is an amazing book, and I didn't really know anything about it, and I, so I had the perfect experience of just starting to read it, and I think as soon as I realized what I was doing, that it was this uh, an extraordinary way into a situation that would normally be treated in a completely different way, and by doing this, by just that simple choice of the boy as the, as the point of view, it ended up you know, allowing her to talk about such universal aspects of human life, from parenting, just childhood, and what it's like to, to have to leave the sort of safe uh, illusions and myths and fantasies of childhood behind. And I was just, and I was very moved by the book, I think, also because my little boy was four when I read the novel. And so, you know, I was, you know, I was wide open to a, to a character like that, and, and it made me think about parenting, and even and, and simultaneously made me think about being a child myself. So, anyway, I just I, I, I fell in love with it. Is it based? I mean, I know it's fiction, but is it based on anything? Because we've seen stories like this, horrifying stories. And sure. um, it, it was written before the 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 recent the Cleveland case, for example, in the states. It was written before that. I think what inspired Emma to write it was the Austrian case, the Fritzl case. And, but she didn't base it on that in that, I think she just thought how extraordinary the idea of could you and what would it be like to try and parent a child in such a circumstance. And, um, and she, I remember her saying that she, she said, you know, sometimes being a parent in the, in the best of circumstances can feel like being in a locked room. It can be both the most amazing and you know, life-saving experience, but it can also be tough. And um, so she, she then decided to, I suppose, explore that setup, but for it's, it's all of these amazing um, resonances that, that the situation can have with normal life. Um, but she, she did, and then actually what, pretty soon after it was published, several really high-profile cases emerged in the States. It's amazing. I think in the Elizabeth uh, Fritzl case, she was actually in that room for like something like 24 years or something. Yeah, I mean, it's most of the cases, 
if you can believe it, are much, much grimmer than the one we chose. And I think it's be or the one Emma chose, it's because I think those circumstances would have totally overwhelmed um, the capacity of the film to talk about, you know, to talk about love, which is what it is doing. Or it would have, I think, been really hard to tell this story. So Emma, uh, you know, she, she simplified and she really simple things like the existence of natural light and, you know, the fact that the boy is successfully preserved from knowing what's really happening. That's what allows this story to lift off and be about something else. How many people in here have actually read the book Room before you got here? Okay, wow, that's quite a few. Quite, quite a few literate people in the crowd here. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, you what obviously the rest, the rest of the book <laughs> don't read at all. <laughs> I don't. Um, I just go see the movie, and I love this movie because, uh, yeah, first of all, I love the fact that you gave or the producers, or however it came about, the screenwriter is the actual author of the book. Yeah. And that's very rare in, yeah. in movies. Yeah, you're told, you know, among the other things that you're not supposed to do, like work with children and animals and all that stuff, the other one is don't, oh, don't let the author adopt their own work because they're going to be so precious. So, you know, you won't be able, to, I suppose the, the basic idea is that you're not going to be able to bully them quite the way that you're supposed to. That's the that's the theory, but actually, Emma's. The, you know, we we hit it off, and we felt always that we were working for the same goal, which is to find a, a way in this other language of cinema to tell the, this story. And uh, I think it was a leap of faith. You always have to make these leaps of faith when you do anything in anything as 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 messy as making a film. But uh, we're. You know we're closer now than we were when we started the process. So, so I think it's a, it, and I'm, I'm proud of that because it, it's important to me that she feels that what's being made is true to the essence of her book. And she actually agreed with a lot of the things that had to be changed. I mean, she was right yeah. on board with you on that. Yeah, she was. She was totally on board. I mean, she. And, I, and in, in my first contact with her, I was pretty clear about what I felt were the challenges and what might have to change and. And she was. She just wanted to make it as good as it could be. And and, and actually, on, on on several occasions, I was the one who would say, "No, no, you should go back to the novel. You can, you know, you there are there are aspects of the novel which might seem tricky from the outside in a film adaptation, but you know, it wasn't. In other words, it wasn't her going. I'm the one who's, you know, uh, she never nails in the novel." <laughs> You know, while I was dragging it away from her, she she was. It was often me who was saying, "No, actually, those things that are kind of counterintuitive and and don't feel like they might work in the film. I think there's a way of making them work." And, and encouraging her to go back and use some stuff from the novel that she had already decided to to check out. I think what you did so extraordinary because I can't imagine looking at the basic story here and how you're going to approach it as a, from a directorial point of view. That the first half, of, uh, you know, that a whole section there is in that little ten by ten room so your approach to making that cinematic and move and not static i mean you did a great job it's you know it's funny when we, we when we were thinking about it you know myself the designer and the director of photography we decided well we got together several months before we were supposed to shoot with this bottle <laughs> and, and we thought like um we should build a mock-up of the of the room just to see if we, we all sort of assumed that we would have to cheat a bit, and if we didn't make it a bit bigger, it was going to be a total disaster, it would be a nightmare. We thought, well, let's, let's, so we built it about half as big again as, as it is in the film, at 16 by 16. Right. And we went in there with lenses, and there was no story. There was no, like, in, a, in other words, although it's a constraint, it's, it's such a huge part of the story. And, and, and to cheat and not really work in those, in that smaller space, would just, you know, you would lose so much of what makes that special. Because the point of the novel, I suppose, and the point of the film is that even such a, a constrained and, and basic space could, can constitute the whole world for a child. And actually, it can be the, 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 the place of, a, of, of something like a complete childhood. Um, and, and if you're just cheating, then you're not making that point. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're making it too easy for yourself. But the challenges were there. I mean, they were, 
one thing I was keen to be able to do was to shift the focus so that sometimes the audience would forget in a way, and you, you can tell me if you feel this is true, that there are periods of time, I think, in that room section where you're so involved in the story that's happening between the two of them, or you're involved in, in Jack's world and, you, and, and his feelings. And for those periods, you don't feel the sort of suffocation or the claustrophobia. And then other times, we shoot in a slightly different way, which shows you a bit more, and then you can be reminded that actually everything that I'm watching this whole complex emotional ecosystem is taking place in this tiny box. And so we work very hard to kind of to find ways of transitioning from those two points of view. Really amazing. Uh, the cast, of course, extraordinary cast, and, and uh, Marie Larson, who, who really wanted to be here tonight, but I mean, this is a wonderful performance because the character is so complex. She's the mother, and you see that mother-son um, relationship. And then in the second half of the movie, she's the daughter. Yeah, she's 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 like this. She is, you know, she is so capable in the first half. She's so, you know, she's a sort of lioness, and she's she's doing that thing that parents do, which is dealing with their own problems and then turning this kind of encouraging, everything's okay, reassuring face to their children. And that happens in, in every family, if it, you know. And, um, but then she's, then she's also having to perform, so she's performing in a way for her child, she has to perform a different role and play a very delicate game with old Nick. And then she's got, she's got to act out something else when she's, when she's acting the mother whose boy is dead. And then she has to act in the interview as this kind of mature, well-adjusted young woman, and then and, and 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 then there's this collapse period in the middle where where she reverts to the kind of teenager that she was when she when she left. And I think everybody can relate to that feeling. It doesn't matter how old you are or how seemingly self-confident you are. It only takes about 15 minutes back in your parents' house before you feel all the same. You know, irritation, resentment. You know. 15 minutes that long? Uh, yeah, right. That's, that's because I've had a lot of therapy, you see five. <laughs> <laughs> well, the real find here, you know, we knew Brie Larson from some, some other films, but you have uh, Jake Tremblay, Jacob Tremblay, who was, what, seven or eight when he shot the picture? Seven when we started, yeah. Playing five-year-old. Yeah. Um, Which he thought was a little bit humiliating. It took a bit of a sway. <laughs> yeah. Where do you find it? An actor that age, so capable of playing a role that complicated and that sophisticated, really. I think you just get very lucky because there is no, we had no guarantee that we would find a boy capable who looks right. Is that that amazing transition phase between being a real baby and being a little boy? And that's, it wouldn't work. The story wouldn't work. If he was too old, you think, come on, you've already have asked a lot of questions and he already would be too interested in Elmick and if he's too young you think there's no way he can do that escape is impossible. Uh, so we just we did this huge trawl and I spent a lot of time saying to Emma and other people, oh it'll be fine, you know. This will be fine, there's top professionals working on this, we'll absolutely have our child and then going home and quietly weeping <laughs> into my brandy <laughs> thinking this is never gonna happen because we're so many kids. Um, and then up pops this amazing boy who, he, it was really interesting because he was very assured in his tape. He, he, his parents put him on tape. And his parents aren't showbiz people at all. He's just a kid who's interested in acting. And if anything, my only worry was that he was slightly too professional, slightly too polished. I think he'd done quite a few um, TV commercials and he'd done a voice in a Smurfs film. Did you think about the lead? To that and, and um, you know, but he was quite sort of bing and zingy, and which is fine if you're selling toothpaste, but is it, in a real film would feel a bit psychotic, you know, that kind of that sort of commercial theatric. As soon as I got into a room with him, and I chatted to him and, and asked him, well, what would I like, forget that this is on in a film or a story? What would a real boy do? You know, how how would a real boy sit? And and and. And then got him to just see: Could he like hold a look? Could he? What's what was his face like at rest? Would he? Would he want to be performing? Would he be able to sort of 
go down to that, I would call it kind of, it's like a pilot like an old gas cooker, you know, an old gas stove, where there's always a little bit of, and really great accuracy, even when they're doing nothing, there's that little tiny thing burning, absolutely there. Um, loads of, loads of, you know, really hard to get that performance because he's seven years old and because he gets distracted or he's kicking his feet against the table or he's not in the mood or, or he, you know, or he's embarrassed about something, about, about having to shout or whatever. But once you did the work and you got him there, eventually, then it would just, you know, and I said to somebody recently that it, it's amazing how, so a talent like acting, it's a, it's a kind of latent capacity. It sits there for the circumstances that bring it out. And it, I, it must be like, there must have been a point where Tiger Woods had never held a golf club, and then somebody gave him a golf club. And initially he didn't know how to hold it, and then somebody showed him where to put his hands, and roughly how to stand. And then suddenly, whatever this natural gift is, goes, oh, I wrote that. This feels comfortable to me. And it was like that with Jake, that you would, you you sometimes have to get him around, you have to work him around to, to a place where, where, where he was nearby it. So, so for example, at the end of towards the end of the film, when when his mother's being wheeled away on the on the on the gurney, you know, and he's standing up top of the stairs and he's crying. That was the first time he cried for real. I mean, there were tears in other parts, but that we we would help him with this or whatever. And uh, he cried for real. And when I caught caught cut, he was like. Yes. 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 And it was running down to his mum and dad. But I did it. I did it. I got it. I know how to do it. It's totally amazing. And it's kind of. And if you saw me about that high, you know, when we were when we were in Toronto, um, he got given a suit by Ralph Lauren, which is fantastic. I was dressed like this. He was wearing a Ralph Lauren suit. Well, this isn't right. I've been working for twenty years. It's just right. But um, but, but then. I remember seeing in the night of the, the main screening, I saw the ballet guy from the, from the hotel pushing one of those little trolleys with the sort of golden arch hanger thing, and one little tiny suit hanging on. <laughs> He's very well dressed. I met him the other night, um, and you know, I asked him about working with you, and he said, you know, Lenny is one of the finer directors I've worked with. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I mean, you know, this kid, he's something. That wasn't his hair, was it? Or was yeah, that's, it? That's a wig, it's a great wig. Yeah, really good wig. Yeah, cool. Do you guys have any questions out there? If you do, just raise your hand. If you don't, just stare at us. Um, nobody has, oh yes, right up there, I see you. Hi. Sure, I mean, it's a combination of research and just imagination. So the interior of room, we did have to do an awful lot of stuff, even even after the novel was written, to, to you know, more stuff about how it would look. And Ethan Tobin, the designer, did amazing work. I think Emma did a lot of research in things like real cases, but also, um, uh, you know, there are prisons in Scandinavia where mothers and children can be together and then those children have to go back out into the world. There are like cases of adoption from countries where kid, kid circumstances change really quickly. So she did all this kind of interesting research around the topic. And we, we looked at, I mean, all of the objects and things in the room, had to be, every single thing had to be thought about. Even some, you know, things like, okay, where would their shoulders rub against the tiles? They'd be more worn at that point you know, where the light falls on them, they're more faded from the skylight. And it was amazing, for such a small space, it was an amazing process of imagination that took us, like we went into every single detail, but that was great so that by the time we started shooting it, we felt we really knew it, because it, you're right, initially you just go, how can I imagine this, it's so alien, um, how do you start and it not feel completely false? The answer is to take a long time, you go through a long process so that by the time you get there, you, you at least hope that you have some understanding of how it operates. Yes? Um, this is a very powerful role for a woman to play. Were you and Brie conscious during the process of this to ensure that the character of Ma was still a very powerful and strong person and never the damsel in distress victim? 
Yes, absolutely. It's a good question because um, one of the things about the film is, and the novel, is that it's told in the t in the terms of the survivors. It's not told in the terms of the of the perpetrator. And it's very often that those stories are. In other words, you see the capture. It's all the mother's absolute fear and the, the, the woman's total fear and panic and passivity. Or, and it was really important to us. And also, it's a, it's a definite choice that was made that we didn't get into any of the sort of Stockholm Syndrome thing, which, is, which does, of course, happen. But we've seen that story. And the fact that she retains her capacity to, to outsmart him, and in a way, in an extraordinary way, she kind of has a power over him. That's why he doesn't unroll the rug. I mean, that took us a lot of work. Because if you don't believe that he would go and put the kid in the truck and go to bury him like he's been told, if you think, look, he doesn't care. But he clearly, somehow, she, she has managed to gain a certain hold on him. And so, yes, yeah, she's always this extremely oppressive character. And she gets to be really angry as well, angry with her mother. And those, those, we felt those things were really important. Yes, right there. Uh, as a director, did you feel limited because you only had to tell the first part of the story within four walls? What were you afraid about? I, I didn't feel limited because of going, like taking his point of view seriously, Jack's point of view, it just felt like every day we would go in and I never thought, oh God, please get me out of here. I can't shoot this part again. Because even though it's one small location, it's actually many locations, you know. It just that it all shrinks down. It's like a different scale. So the interior of the wardrobe, under the bed, um, the kitchen end, the bath, they all have, they all gain a certain, because you're there for so long, you're focusing on them for so long, they all have their own personality. And it's kind of amazing that when we go back at the end, and that's exactly the same dimensions, it feels like you could have possibly have spent an hour in that place. There's no way you could have spent an hour in that place, but we really did. And it, it sort of, it becomes a world, and, and I thought of it more as a challenge rather than a constraint, and it was a really interesting one from a filmmaking point of view. Cool. Yeah, right here in the front. Um, my question is about the film's music, because there's great moments of silence throughout, but there's also the moments when it starts to build up. How did you find the balance? There? Right, so it's by the music he's asking about. And the balance between silence and, 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 and music. Well, I work with the same, so the same composer who composed all the songs on the soundtrack for Frank, which is my previous film, and a completely insane musical score, did this. He's a really talented guy who I've known since our equivalent of third grade. We've been friends since we were nine. And he's done music for everything that I've done. And the great thing about him is he's usually the one saying, I don't think you need music there. You know, which is, believe me, very unusual for a composer. Um, you know, he's a real film person, so, and I think, I tend to use music, I, I tend to not use music to underscore emotion. I prefer to use it as, as you know, transitional element or an element to get, to just create a, a, t a different tone. So, for example, in the early parts of the story, when you know, you're beginning to realize that what's going on is pretty grim, the music maintains a kind of bittersweet quality that captures Jack's sense of things. And that, using music like that, it just opens up this space where it, you're, not everything is banging the same drum. You know, if you've got a tense sequence and you put tense music, you're sort of just saying the same thing twice. Whereas in the escape, you've got this incredibly tense sequence, but actually the music is underscoring the birth and the arrival in the world. And that's what makes that seem interesting, that you're not just going, yeah, here's a red thing, and I'm going to paint it more red, and then I'm going to put some red furniture in here. <laughs> yeah. What's the name of the composer? Stephen Mannix. He's, yeah, he's really, really good. Fabulous. Really good. Um, okay, uh, anybody else? Uh, sure. Yes, right there, I see you. Go ahead. Okay, that one. Okay, take him, and then right down here. Okay, go. Well, we felt that it, it, I find, I like that moment when you think, okay, I know the rule now. The rule is we don't see his face. And that's because for that section, we're, we're in Jack's world. 
But when he turns and you see him for the first time in, the bit, in a big close-up looking at a man, that's this thing that I was constantly trying to do, which is to move between Jack's version of this place and hers. So that's hers. And, and for me, it, we, we're constantly negotiating that transition. I mean, you could definitely have done it. You could have, you could have not shown him, but I somehow weirdly feel that would have given him too much power. You know, because you're like hiding the, you know, that makes him a sort of an object of myth or something. Whereas he's just this idiot, nasty, crazy guy. And, 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 and so it felt to me interesting to just jump to him at that point. And yes, right there. Oh. Um, uh, hi. <laughs> It is there, actually, and I don't know if anybody picked it up, but it's a moment where you look, there's two places in the room where one she he lies across her and she's pulling up her shirt, and another one on the bed where, in fact, if you look, you can actually see a little bit of her, her chest. Now, it's, we did it subtly because it's, it's tricky. In the, in the, there was one scene where, he, where you, we, we did shoot something where it was much more explicit. It's just for other reasons that scene didn't really Hold. And so we're left with these traces of it. But I think that's okay because, okay, in the novel he's talking to you about it, it's his voice. And it's no big deal for him. And so we shot it like it was no big deal. And, and it's there, and I think if you watch it again, you'll pick it up more. But we certainly weren't trying to hide it. It's just, it, it didn't, and there was another, it didn't sort of have the same. Uh, maybe prominence because you're not hearing it in his voice. Okay, got time for one more. If anybody else uh, has one, yes, oh, right there. Yeah. So there's no reference to Ma's name in the novel. There's a couple of things. There's a few things you can do in a piece of literature that just never work in film. One is. You know that the novel that's not set in any particular place, which room is not set in any particular place, because, because Jack's talking, you, you don't know what city it is, you know it's an American city. As soon as you start filming something, the cops have to have badges, the street signs have to say something, and if, you, if they don't, it just looks silly and vague. So you have, to, you have to project and invent lots of this sort of detail to make it real. And the same thing with, with Ma, because he always calls her Ma, and he says in the novel, Grandma talked to her, but she used her other name. The thing is, we're there. And therefore, unless people just bizarrely never used her name, we would have, we'd sort of have to hear it. So there's a whole load of things that, that there's, a, there's a sort of rush of objectivity which happens in film. And, and you've got to work with that, I think, anyway, because if you go with the, if you go with the sort of magic realist or absurdist or whatever, Approach for me, film that's not ever as strong. It's certainly a story like this as 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 feeling like you're having a proper encounter with real people. You know, it's a great movie. I wish you the best of luck with it. It's playing now and it's going to open wider in the next couple of weeks. So tell your